My name is Shivank Misra, and this is my video lab report for Intro Physics 2212 at Georgia Tech. This lab investigates circuits and capacitors. I'll first introduce some key ideas and relevant formulae, and then discuss the main takeaways from parts A and B of the lab as listed below. I'll then explore in detail the RC circuit section of the lab, in particular the time dependence of the potential difference across a capacitor as it discharges. I'll go over my experimental data, the graphs I derive from that data, and my subsequent data analysis. Finally, I'll answer a few key questions about the lab. So some of the key ideas in this lab are the circuit rules, Ohm's law, and energy and charge conservation. There are also various circuit elements you need to be familiar with, which I've listed here, as well as understanding the difference between parallel and series circuits. Additionally, you need to understand RC circuits and time dependence and quasi-steady states in RC circuits. And finally, it pays to understand linearization, as this is a key step we'll be taking in our lab to calculate certain results. So here are some of the formulae relevant to this lab. I'm not going to go over each one in detail, but you may take a look at them if you so wish. I will, however, draw your attention to the last formula, which is a formula for the equation of a line, expressed in terms of potential difference, time, resistance, and capacitance. We'll be using this equation and our experimental data in part three of this presentation to calculate RC for the circuit, which I found to be six, a value which was consistent across experimental and analytical results. So firstly, we have a series circuit with two different resistors, two ammeters, and a battery. I found the ammeter readings to be the same for both the ammeters, and the value stayed positive even if I connected an ammeter backwards. If I replace one of the ammeters with a voltmeter, the current in the other ammeter is the same, and the potential difference is 3 volts. And if I close the circuit and measure potential differences at different points, I find the results shown at the bottom of this slide. I found the sum of potential differences across the circuit to be 0. Since the circuit is just one large loop, the fact that the sum of potential differences is 0 is in accordance with the loop rule. In fact, here's a look at the diagram that shows the potential at different points in the circuit. As you see, the battery raises the potential. The wires don't really do anything as they're assumed to be ideal and therefore do not have any resistance. The resistors, however, lower the potential, which is why the potential difference across them, which was shown in the previous slide, is negative. The ammeter does not significantly affect the potential as it is assumed to be ideal and therefore has zero or very little resistance. So to answer a few key questions, a few questions for this section, why doesn't the addition of a voltmeter in parallel change the ammeter reading? Well, because the voltmeter has a very high resistance and therefore only a very small amount of current flows through it, and so the current in the rest of the circuit remains constant. And what happens if an ammeter is connected in parallel with the 100 ohm resistor? Well, then both ammeters read 0.06 amps. And lastly, we were asked to calculate the resistance of various circuit elements using Ohm's law, which states that R is equal to the magnitude of delta V over I. The values I calculated are shown at the bottom of this slide. As for RC circuits, when a bulb is connected in series with a capacitor and a battery, it starts off bright and then slowly dims until it turns off. The same thing happens if you connect a bulb to just a charged capacitor. It starts off bright and then slowly dims until it's off. And in both these cases, the current starts out large and then slowly decreases to zero, which is why the bulb dies out. The time taken to, to charge and discharge capacitors which were connected in series to resistors of varying resistance are also shown at the bottom of this slide. So now moving on to the main experiment, the time dependence of potential difference across a discharging capacitor. My experimental data is shown here in the form of a table and now here in the form of a graph. This graph of potential difference versus time resembles an exponential decay graph. If we linearize this data by graphing the natural log of potential difference over delta v naught, we get this graph. This, as expected, is a linear graph for which we have the lab-specific formula which I showed you at the beginning of this presentation and which is also shown here above. Applying this formula, we get a slope of negative 0.167. The RC value is the negative of 1 over the slope. So the RC value is calculated to be 5.999. Similarly, if we calculate RC by simply multiplying R and C, we also get 6, a value reasonably close enough to 5.999 for us to conclude that the experiment was successful and produced reasonable results. Lastly, to answer the what if questions related to this lab, what if we'd done the lab in real life and used an actual ammeter? What's, and what's different about that? And how might this have affected our results? Well, an ammeter is designed to have very low resistance, so an ideal ammeter has exactly zero resistance. Of course, this is not possible in real life, as all objects have some level of electrical resistance, and even the best ammeters have a very small amount of resistance. Adding resistance to a series circuit dis dis decreases the amount of current flowing through it. So had we done this lab in real life, we'd be getting lower than expected current values due to the internal resistance of the ammeter. 
And if we did the experiment in real life using a real battery and capacitor with no resistor in the circuit, our ideal model would predict that the capacitor would be charged instantly. This is due to the fact that the model assumes no resistance in the wires nor in the battery, and therefore an infinitely large current would be able to flow and would therefore charge the capacitor instantly. In real life, however, there is always a small bit of resistance in the batteries themselves as well as in the wires, so the capacitor cannot be charged instantly. It would be charged fairly quickly, but certainly not instantly as predicted by the ideal model. Thank you for listening and have a nice day.